This is the Kings Bowl lava field, uh, one of the young lava fields in the Snake River Plain of southern Idaho. This is about 2,200 years old. That's when this, uh, these uh, lavas erupted here. And we can actually get a look at the vent for this eruption uh, right here. So this type of an eruption, rather than forming the shield volcanoes we see in a lot of parts of the Snake River Plain, this was an eruption along a fracture, a crack in the earth where magma oozed out of that fracture and pooled out onto the surrounding surface. This is what's known as a fissure eruption. And we see these in a few places in the, uh, in the Snake River Plain. Uh, they're not the dominant eruptive style. We see these near Craters of the Moon, and of course this actually is part of cr the Craters of the Moon monument, the far southern end. Um, but up near the main part of the park at the north end, we see some of these. But these fissures, these big deep cracks that are over 100 feet deep in places, is where this uh, low viscosity kind of runny lava oozed out of the, the ground, and you can sort of see the stacked layers here. There's actually a lot more to see here, so I'm going to kind of explain some things as we kind of walk around uh, and look at this. These fissures run more or less north-northwest, and we believe that their orientation was somewhat controlled by uh, basin and range extension, basically the east-west stretching that is being experienced in uh, this part of Idaho as well as Nevada, Utah, and other adjoining states. We believe that the the extension or the stretching of the Earth's crust is what kind of drove the location and the orientation of these eruptive fissures about 2,000 years ago. Um, so for much of its length, if you look at it on a uh, like Google Earth or something like that, you can actually trace these fissures out from the south end of uh, the Craters of the Moon monument to all the way across the desert to the Craters of the Moon region. This is a part uh, of a larger volcanic structure known as the Great Rift. So it's upwards of, I think, 40, 50, maybe 60 miles long, cutting across uh, the Snake River Plain and joining the southern end of the Snake River Plain, <clears throat> where I'm at here, to the northern end there. So this fissure or series of fissures, sometimes they're offset a little bit, uh, is continuous for quite a distance. Um, so we're going to focus on an area just to the north of this eruptive fissure and look at the main area that's known as King's Bowl. Um, so in addition to this being a fissure eruption, there's one little zone of it that kind of stands out and is unique and also forms some really unique uh, landscapes and features, volcanic features, um, that you just don't see in a lot of other places. Really what makes this place kind of special. So it's really, as you can see, it's really rough to walk on this stuff. Lots of loose, angular boulders. Uh, but if you look in the distance, if you can see, it's a lot smoother out there. It's more of like a lava surface. And so we're gonna explain the reason for this as we come up a little bit closer here to the feature that's known as King's Bowl proper. So here we have an enormous pit in the earth, um, maybe a hundred or so feet wide, definitely a hundred or so feet deep. There's even a little patch of snow down there. But along this fissure, it's pretty narrow, and here we have this crazy zone that's much wider. Um, this even shows up pretty nicely on satellite views on Google Earth. So why would this zone be so much wider than the sort of narrow crack that we see that defines much of the eruptive fissure? And to answer that, what we also need to do is come over here along the west side of Kings Bowl and look at some of these very large and angular rocks. So we've got one right here. Um, we've got one there. There's another one that we're kind of getting coming up to over here. And these big blocks are, gosh, that one's like maybe six, seven feet in diameter. Um, and you can see there's a whole boulder field of these rocks. Basically what happened here was this eruptive fissure when it was erupting about 2,200 years ago, after it had erupted a good portion of its lava, at some point, uh, groundwater started seeping in and mixing with the lava. 
And when that happened, it made the situation much more explosive as the lava heated up the water, the water flashed to steam. As you turn liquid water into steam, that's an expansion process. And there was enough energy from that expansion to actually start to shatter the blocks of lava and throw them out. So this once quiet eruption of lava just kind of oozing out of these cracks and filling in the landscape here became explosive. Ultimately, as it's erupting from the vent, it's over time creating this large pit called King's Bowl along the fissure and big blocks of rock are being thrown out of the vent area onto the landscape. So these huge rocks you see around here were all erupted from the ground as this eruption became what we call phreatomagmatic. Fancy word, it basically just means you had groundwater mixing with magma creating explosive conditions. And so these big blocks of rock were being thrown across the ground. Um, and as you would expect, they're much larger near the vent or near King's Bowl. And as you move away, they get a little bit smaller in size, but they're pretty angular. You can see that uh, there's some different colors to them. So that indicates that this thing was uh, tapping into older uh, lavas that were already here on the landscape and then blowing those out as well. Uh, so these big, you know, nearly refrigerator sized blocks were thrown out of the ground. Simultaneously, as that was taking place, over here on the west side of Kings Bowl, this was an immense lava lake. So imagine just a huge area of lava because it's pretty flat here, um, wasn't flowing very fast. And it was in the process of cooling and crystallizing, but it, but it had developed a crust across its surface. So when the eruption at Kings Bowl became explosive, um, this lava lake existed. It was cooling and crystallizing slowly, but it had already developed a, a skin or a crust of solidified material with the molten material just underneath. As we get out here, you can actually see the lava lake, but it's strewn with all these angular blocks. These were all rocks thrown out onto the lava lake surface. Most of them are sitting on top, but in places you can see big angular holes where these big rocks actually came and punctured the lava lake. There's a block right there that actually punctured the surface uh, of the lava lake, making a hole. There's another one there. And then the final, here's a really exceptional one here. So there's a big block here that my shoe's on that's embedded in uh, the lava lake surface. You can kind of see a color change there. This is uh, very fine grained and dense, doesn't have all the bubbles and holes that you see in a lot of uh, basalts. There's another one there. So imagine just, you know, these big boulders raining out of the sky, falling down onto this lava lake and punching holes in it. What's cool about the story is that in places where there was still molten lava beneath the surface, the lava actually oozed up through the hole created by the block that went in and made these kind of little mushroom shaped features here. So this little mound of, of black lava that kind of looks like a cow pie or a little Hershey's kiss is actually where one of these airborne blocks broke through the lava lake and then lava oozed out of that hole to create what we call a squeeze up. Um, here's another one right here, at least partially one, kind of looks like a cow patty. All these low mounds that we're seeing here are all these squeeze up features created by these airborne blocks of lava flying down and puncturing the lava lake and then allowing it to ooze up. This one's actually pretty cool here. You can actually see a couple of the blocks uh, that probably punctured the surface and then this thing oozed back out of, or maybe it oozed out of some blocks that were on the surface. So pretty cool landscape, really neat features here at King's Bowl. Uh, a really exceptional place to visit uh, here at Craters of the Moon National Monument in Southern Idaho. This is the inside of the Kings Bowl area at the southern end of Craters of the Moon National Monument. Uh, I had a video I put together that you can look for that talks about this eruption and the geology here. Uh, up at the surface, where I point out some cool features, but there's actually uh, a way to get down in this thing 
So I thought it might be fun to shoot a short video uh, showing some of the cool features you see both in the walls of the sides of the fissure um, and then down looking at the bottom of the fissure itself. Um, and so there's a little path here. And the first thing is you can kind of see all these stacked uh, flows right here. These are all from the eruptive event 2,200 years ago from this, this volcanic vent. So all of this is stacked lavas, just you know, one lava flow oozing out, covering the other, kind of like pancake batter, um, covering the landscape until you get about here. Uh, and this big break here, from here down, these are older lavas. So these are lavas that erupted probably from localized shield volcanoes or other vents uh, in the area. It's all basalt still, um, but sometimes what we do as geologists is try to count how many flow units or cooling units or, or in individual lava flows there are. If I wheel over to the other side, you can see a pretty prominent break or a crack running through uh, the wall over there. And that I believe is also, you know, so the upper 10 to 12 feet is all lava and real estate that was added when this thing erupted. But everything below this point is older lavas. Um, but they give us a cool couple cool features here. We have this sort of profile view through these basalt flows. And so this kind of gives us a view we don't often get in other places. Usually basalt flows have uh, these bus bubbles, these gas bubbles on the surface near the top um, of the flow. These are called vesicles. So these are nothing more than gases that are trying to escape the lava. As they get closer to the lava flow, there's less pressure, overlying pressure on them. So they're able to expand and form uh, bubbles that are large enough to see with the naked eye. Um, we kind of move along here. Let's see, what else is there? Um, this is pretty cool here. You can actually see, if I kind of get down there a little bit, or maybe back in here, you can see a little brown layer in between these lava flows. And that's just a little layer of soil. Uh, it shows up over here a little bit thicker. So this is what we call a paleosol. This is a soil horizon between two lava flows. Um, and sometimes we can find material in here that can be dated. Um, but if, if anything, it lets us know that there was some period of time between the eruption of the underlying flow and the one above, because you had to have time for the lavas to maybe to get weathered, or maybe some of this stuff was blown in by the wind, but you had to develop some soils in order for the next flow to uh, cover it. Uh, this might have been in some little depression here, and that's why it's quite thicker. If you actually kind of trace it to the left, you can see that the, the soil kind of pinches out and the two lava flows are sitting one on top of another. Um, right here, the surface of this flow has some of these nice, smooth, ropey surfaces. This is what we call pahoehoe. So this is uh, very common on the tops of these lava flows. Um, this lava flow is a little different color. Looks like it has some uh, little white crystals in it. And then the other thing that it has that's kind of interesting is you can see chains of vesicles that go vertically. These are called pipe vesicles. So this might be where um, vesicles sort of coalesce and nucleate together and then rise vertically um, up through the lava flow, even though there's substantial pressure on them. We can actually see the, the contact here with this. On, here's another flow below it, and here's the bottom of this flow right here, and these pipe vesicles kind of coming out of them. In some places, you can tell, I'm not sure I'm convinced here, but sometimes we can see these pipe vesicles uh, tilted or oriented kind of like dominoes, um, something like this. And maybe these ones are crudely showing that this way. I'm not totally convinced, but maybe. And if that's the case, if you can convince yourself there's a, there's a preferred orientation of these, that sometimes indicates which way the lava was flowing. So as these vesicles are rising, if the lava is still moving, they kind of rotate it over uh, to some other orientation. So another flow here, more pipe vesicles in this flow above. So we're going down a little further. Um, there's some of the snow. It's, uh, let's see, May 6th. There's a patch of snow. So this thing is so deep and shaded from the sun that it has snow, um, you know, into the early part of summer. At some point, the sun will get a little higher, the air will get, get a little warmer, and that'll melt out. Um, but these, these deep fissures, just like lava tubes, are places, I'm sure when I get down here to the bottom, it'll feel a lot colder 
That's why the snow is kind of hanging on there as well. Um, these places, uh, in fact, just north of here, um, there was a place that was a common uh, tourist attraction, I guess, maybe in the 70s and 80s called Crystal Ice Cave. And so this same fissure system uh, has a cave system that you can go through. Um, and because it's so insulated and so deep, the water that seeps down through the basalt uh, freezes and there's ice in there. They've closed it off since then because these are pretty unstable areas. In fact, you can kind of see the whole wall of Kings Bowl here is fractured and all this rock is teetering and probably going to fall at some point soon, um, geologically anyway. You can imagine all the water getting in there and freeze thaw, freeze thaw. And so the walls of this thing are um, quite unstable and that's why they kind of want people to kind of stay out as much as possible. So we'll, we'll just go down here to the fissure itself, the kind of lowest point you can get to on this end. And of course this won't come across in the video, but already I can feel it's like quite a bit colder down here. It's probably like 70-ish degrees up, up top, but down here uh, in the fissure, it's definitely a lot colder. Uh, and so here's sort of the inner view of this fissure you're looking at an eruptive event you can actually see here oh wow this is cool this is actually where some of the lava drip back down into the fissure these long uh sort of drip features here kind of like a stalactite um uh and uh, just stuck to the wall so this is the actual vent 2200 years ago this is where lava was rising to the surface which is ironic because it was obviously very hot then and now on a nice warm summer day, this is the coolest place to be temperature wise. So uh, pretty incredible. There's the view up towards uh, the sky, King's Bowl.